For millennia, humans have looked up into the sky and wondered what lies ahead of them in the afterlife. Our souls innately desire an answer to what is perhaps life's greatest mystery. That which awaits us when we walk through the door into the world beyond. But God doesn't conceal the details about your eternal resting place. Look in God's word and you'll find a glimpse into heaven. Streets brighter than gold. God's radiant throne and the eternal home of Jesus Christ. All the magnificent details are written in the pages of Scripture. What heaven will look like. How your soul will get there. If you'll be reunited with loved ones once you arrive. And how your body will appear for eternity. That is but just a sliver of what we can know about eternity which promises to be a place beyond your wildest dreams. All you have to do is open the Bible and you'll find that inside, God is revealing the mysteries of heaven. Now, here's your host and Bible teacher, Dr. David Jeremiah. History, or at least legend, tells us that when a Spanish explorer named Ponce de Leon explored what is now Florida in 1513, he was searching for the fountain of youth. Well, we know he didn't find it because so many people are still looking for it today. There's certainly nothing wrong with trying to stay vibrant and healthy, but eventually time takes its toll, except in one location. Heaven will be a place where our body never wears out where there is no sickness, no injury, and no aging. Today, another mystery of heaven is revealed as we discuss the ultimate extreme makeover. If you'd like to experience a complete physical makeover, then you'll want to hear how you can have it on today's edition of Turning Point. We all have questions about heaven, and many of us assume that we can't know the answers, but nothing could be further from the truth. God's Word is full of detailed information about heaven, if we only know where to look. Inside Dr. Jeremiah's book, Revealing the Mysteries of Heaven, Dr. David Jeremiah will lead you through God's Word, uncovering the answers to your pressing questions about the world beyond, including, if you've lost a child, will you be reunited in heaven? How are our souls transported to heaven? And where exactly is it located? As you read, you'll discover that the more you know about heaven, the more you'll live in the reality that awaits you every day. This inspiring book is only available from Turning Point, and it's yours as a thank you when you give a gift of any amount. And if you give $60 or more, we will send you the Heaven Set, which includes Dr. Jeremiah's book, Study Guide, his current teaching series on your choice of CD or DVD album, and the Is There a Heaven brochure. If your gift exceeds $100, Dr. Jeremiah will also send you the popular Answers to Questions About Heaven book. Don't miss out on the scriptural look at your future home, only from Turning Point. Contact us today. Thank you for watching Revealing the Mysteries of Heaven here on Turning Point timeless teaching from Dr. David Jeremiah. We appreciate your viewership as Turning Point delivers the unchanging Word of God to an ever-changing world. And now, here is Dr. Jeremiah with his message, The Ultimate Extreme Makeover. Benjamin Franklin, in his epitaph, wrote of this present body, which he said, lies in the grave like the cover of an old book with its contents torn out stripped of its lettering, but which will appear once again in a new and more eloquent edition, revised and corrected by the author. <laughs> what a great way to describe what is going to happen to us someday when our bodies receive the ultimate extreme makeover. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 35, Paul puts before us a question, which is really the question for today's message. Here is the question. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? 
How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? And in the next several verses, Paul gives us some contrasts between our current bodies and the body that we're going to have someday. And in doing so, he literally outlines for us all of the various aspects of the ultimate extreme makeover. Now, you have your Bibles open, and I want you to notice that, first of all, the requirement for a resurrected body, the requirement for being resurrected from the dead is you have to be dead, right? The requirement for resurrection is the death of the body. There's no resurrection if there's no death. In fact, Paul, I think, is having a little fun with the Corinthians when he writes in verse 36, foolish one, he says, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. I think Paul's kind of chiding them a little bit and saying, you know, don't be silly. You can't have a resurrection if you don't die. The first observation is so obvious that he makes a little rebuke for his readers for not understanding it. And in essence, he's saying, don't be ignorant or foolish about this. There isn't really anything that you can do about resurrection until, first of all, you die. John 12, 24 says this, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Paul's just laying the foundation here for all of us who have such a hard time even talking about death. I mean, it's such a terrible word. We call it the D word. He says you shouldn't be afraid of death. You should embrace it because if you don't have death, you can't have a resurrected body. If it were somehow possible for anyone in this room to live forever without dying, they would have to live forever in the body they now possess. What a horrible thought that would be. A man that I have greatly appreciated for his writings on the spiritual disciplines is a guy named Dallas Willard. He tells the story of a woman who refused to talk about life beyond death. She absolutely refused to talk about it because she said she didn't want her children to be disappointed if it turned out there was no afterlife. Now, as Willard points out, if there is no afterlife, no one will have any consciousness with which to feel disappointment. Think about that for a moment. On the other hand, he said, if there is an afterlife, whoever enters that next life unprepared may experience far more than mere disappointment. So as much as we don't like to talk about death, Paul helps us to get a little bit of a positive attitude about it right up front, and he says, look, I want to tell you about this new body that God's going to give you, but you have to understand the way to get that new body is you have to walk through the doorway of death to get it, unless you happen to be alive when Jesus returns. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So much as we dislike talking about death, Paul reminds us that without it, there is no resurrection. Now, the second thing he's going to teach us in this passage is that the result of resurrection is a different kind of body. Notice in verses 37 and 38, as you look down at your Bibles here in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body as he pleases to each seed its own body. Now, he is saying that the body that comes out of the grave is different from the body that went into the grave. He's saying, using this illustration, if you put a kernel of corn into the ground in order for it to grow, what comes out of the ground is not the kernel. It's a green stalk that looks very different. It's a part of the kernel. It represents the kernel, but it's not the same. And Paul is saying to us men and women that when we die and our bodies are buried and they go into the ground on the day of resurrection, they're going to come out of the ground different than when they went in. We're not going to have the same... A kind of body that was buried. That's the whole purpose of his discussion here with the Corinthians. The body that emerges from the seed that dies is different from the body that was planted. Now, we're all pretty well acquainted with the kind of bodies that we now occupy. One of the most depressing thoughts that's communicated to me routinely when I go to work out every day is the constant reminder from everybody there that the older you get, you have to work twice as hard to maintain the same level of fitness as you used to get earlier in life. Does that depress anybody else but me? <laughs> I mean, here it is when your life is so busy and you need more and more time, 
you got to take more and more of that time just to stay even, just so you don't fall behind. And, you know, we're all into that to some degree, and re relatively uh, we should be because this is the temple which God has given us and we're supposed to take care of it. But how many will agree that taking care of this temple is getting to be a full-time job? Can I get a witness? <laughs> well, the apostle is going to give us some encouragement here in a broad outline in 1 Corinthians that answers the very question that he poses, what kind of body shall we have? He describes four different qualities of our resurrection body, and he contrasts it with the body we currently have. So no, notice letter A, our new bodies will be indestructible. Our new bodies will be indestructible. Verse 42 says it this way, so is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown, and when you see the word sown here, it means buried. The body is buried in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. The body is buried in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Now, friends, there's only been one body in the history of the universe, in the history of time as we know it. There's only been one body that has not been subject to corruption, and that was the body of the Lord Jesus. The psalmist in Psalm 16:10 said, You will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. There's only been one body that did not see corruption. Jesus was buried, but on the third day, he came out of the grave. His body had not seen corruption. The first thing that Paul teaches us about our new bodies, and this ought to really encourage us all, the first thing he teaches us is that it is not like our old body. Our present bodies wear out. The body we get when we get our extreme makeover is indestructible. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. I notice the older voices are louder than the younger ones. Okay, number two, verse 43, our new bodies will be identifiable. Now watch this, a careful argument here. Paul says in verse 43, our present bodies will be sown or buried in dishonor, but our new bodies will be raised in glory. Paul says that our new bodies will be raised in glory. The word really is the word brilliance. Some people even think and our new bodies may have a little glow to them. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's maybe from this word. It is a glorious body like the glorious body of the risen Savior. Now, I want you to notice the key passage in what our bodies are going to be like in all of the New Testament. It's Philippians chapter 3. I want us to read this out loud together. Maybe we'll just read it from the screen so we'll all be in the same translation, all right? Here we go. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Now, what does that verse say to us about the kind of body that we're going to have? Our body is going to be transformed so that it is like the glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and notice it says, our body is sown in dishonor but it is raised in what, class? It's raised in glory. The glory that the Lord Jesus had in his glorious body is the glory we're going to have in our bodies when we are resurrected from the grave. Now, when the apostle tells us that we are raised in glory, we don't have to doubt what he means. Glory is the description of the body of Jesus. Our new bodies will be just like just like the resurrected body of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what John is talking about when he writes to us in his first epistle. He says, Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it is not yet revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, what does it say? We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And Paul comes back to this powerful thought at the end of his teaching in 1 Corinthians. Notice verse 49 of 1 Corinthians 15. As we have borne the image of the man of dust, that's our current body, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. That's Jesus. Just like we now bear the image of our current body, the old Adam, one day we're going to bear the image of Jesus. We're going to have a body like Jesus. I, like, I almost call this message, Body by Jesus. 
I see all these books out there, body by this person. One day we're going to have bodies by Jesus. I'll tell you, whatever program you're on, you can just give it up because that's the one. That's the one. Now you say, well, Pastor Jeremiah, that's a great theological thought, but what is body by Jesus? What is the body by Jesus? Well, let me tell you how you find that out. The only time that we can observe as humans the body by Jesus is during the 40-day period between the resurrection of Jesus and when he went back to heaven. And you remember toward the end of the Gospels, we have a number of uh, situations where Jesus expressed himself in his resurrection body after he was resurrected, before he went back to heaven. And so when we look at those passages, we can learn some things about Jesus' body, and if our body's going to be like his body, then we'll know what our body's going to be like. Are you with me? So let me just give you three or four things that I've observed about the body of Jesus during the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension. Number one, Jesus said that his body was real. He had a real body. This is really important. Jesus said he had a real body. In Luke 24, 39, we read these words. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. What I want you to know right now is you're not going to have some spirit body that floats around forever. Jesus said, you're going to have a real body. Did you hear what he said? He said, handle me. My body is, is real. Uh, and, and a spirit body is an oxymoron. There isn't such a thing. If you have a body, you don't, it's not spirit. And if you're in the spirit, you're not in the body. Jesus' body was real. And when we get to heaven, we're going to have real bodies. Real transformed bodies like the body of the Lord Jesus when he was resurrected from the grave. Jesus said his body was real. Notice number two. This will greatly encourage many of you. Jesus ate on two occasions. I don't know if any questions have been asked me more is, are we going to eat in heaven? And so the thought when you get to heaven, well, we won't eat. Eating is not just to keep your body alive, but it's a pleasurable experience. Can I get a witness? Yeah. And some of you are already, I'm, you're start, your mouths are starting to salivate, <laughs> thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. I mean, I know. But I want you to notice some things. Here again, this is Jesus in his resurrection body. Luke chapter 24, verses 42 and 43. So they gave Jesus a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. John 21, 12, and 13, Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. And the assumption is that he ate breakfast with his disciples. All right, so we're going to have a real body. We're going to be able to eat. Notice the third thing. Jesus told Thomas to touch his body. Notice verse 27 of John 20. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Once again, I want to remind you that our bodies after the extreme makeover are going to be real bodies like our current bodies, only totally renovated, resurrected, made over We'll be able to eat. We will have the sense of touch. We know that from this experience. Jesus told Mary not to hold on to him. Do you remember that experience? That happened in that period of time. John 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. You can't cling to something that's not touchable. Jesus told Mary, Don't hold on to my body, because I haven't yet ascended to the Father. So people are always asking me, in my new body, Will people know me, and will I know others? Jesus in his resurrection body was real. His disciples knew who he was. Listen to this. They knew that this Jesus who was with them after his death and resurrection was the very same Jesus they had known before his death. 
They knew this so deeply in their hearts that they all went to their death proclaiming the reality of his resurrection and that he came out of the grave, the same Jesus who had gone into the grave, but in his resurrection body, he was the real Jesus, the same Jesus who they knew before and they knew now. And that's the way it'll be for you. When you get to heaven, you're going to know all the people that you met down here, and they're going to know you. It is unthinkable to me that in heaven we will know less than we do here. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says this, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. We will have a greater sense of recognition in heaven than we've ever had here on this earth. Well, our new bodies will be indestructible. Our new bodies will be identifiable. Our new bodies, thirdly, will be incredible. And I mean that, incredible. Verse 43b says, we will be sown in weakness. We will be raised in power. We will be buried in weakness. Isn't that true? When a body's buried, it's without any strength, without any power. But when we come out of the grave, it will be in power. In our current bodies, we are limited in our ability to sustain effort for very long. Isn't that true? It gets harder and harder as we get older and older. We work hard for a few hours and we're exhausted. But in our new bodies, we will have capacities and abilities without any limitation. Nothing will be outside the scope of the possibility for us in our new body. On one occasion, listen to this, on one occasion, Jesus actually entered a room without going through the door. He just appeared in the midst of his disciples. John 20, verse 19 says, the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. In Jesus' resurrection body, he surmounted the limitations of this life. Earth had no power to stop him and our bodies are going to be the same. Finally, our bodies will not only be indestructible and identifiable and incredible, but notice the fourth thing Paul says in verse 44, our new bodies will be infinite. It is buried a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Paul goes to great effort to describe the difference between our earthly body and our heavenly body. He points to Adam as the image bearer for this body. He points to Christ as the image bearer for our new body. He says that we are going to have a spiritual body. Now, let me just talk with you a moment about that because this is a matter of great confusion for a lot of God's people. What is a spiritual body? He's not talking about an immaterial body. We already know that. Jesus was touched. He was handled. Jesus ate. Jesus did not have a quote-unquote spirit body. He had a material body, and we're going to have bodies just like him. So we're not going to have spirit bodies in the sense that we're going to be kind of spooky, if you know what I mean. We're going to have real bodies. Paul is talking here about a real body that is no longer controlled by the physical appetites, but a real body that is now controlled by the spirit. Our new bodies will exist on a higher plane, and our new bodies, instead of being governed by our appetites, will be governed by the Holy Spirit. That's what a spiritual body is. The basic difference between a natural body and a spiritual body is that the former body is suited for life on this earth and our spiritual bodies will be suited for life in heaven for eternity with God. The natural body is soul-controlled. The spiritual body will be spirit-controlled. And Paul tells us that in our current bodies, we could not live in heaven. Verse 50 of chapter 15 says, This I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does corruption inherit incorruption. He is saying that as we are now in our current bodies, we couldn't function in the realm of heaven. But God is going to give us new, real bodies like the ones we have, only completely made over, transformed, and no longer governed by our appetites of the flesh, but governed now by the appetites of the Spirit. Do you understand why I'm so passionate about trying to take people to heaven with me? You know what? I don't want anyone to miss what God has planned 
for his children. So I'm going to ask you today, is there any reason you can think of why you wouldn't want to put your trust in Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive your sin and make a reservation in heaven that is absolutely as certain as it can be. Dr. Jeremiah will return in a moment to close today's program right after this. There are a lot of myths, rumors, and conjecture about heaven. But what can you believe? What is fact and what is fiction? Now, there's a biblically-based book you can trust. A look inside Dr. David Jeremiah's book, Revealing the Mysteries of Heaven, gives you a glimpse into eternity as Dr. Jeremiah answers your most pressing questions about the afterlife. Questions like, how do we get to heaven? Who will be there? And where exactly is it? Dive into this study with Dr. Jeremiah and discover how our understanding of heaven matters today and can focus every other part of our Christian life. This inspiring 10 chapter book is only available exclusively through Turning Point. And it's yours in appreciation for your support of the ministry with a gift of any amount. And if you give $60 or more, we'll send you the Heaven Set, which includes Dr. Jeremiah's book, Study Guide, his current teaching series on your choice of CD or DVD album, and the Is There a Heaven brochure. If your gift exceeds $100, Dr. Jeremiah will also send you the popular Answers to Questions About Heaven book. Don't miss out on the scriptural look at your future home, only from Turning Point. Contact us today. And now with one last word for today's program, here is Dr. Jeremiah. Years of playing basketball as a younger man took its toll on my knees. I don't know if we'll play basketball in heaven or not, but if we do, I'll be ready with brand new knees. I hope you're living with the expectation of receiving a perfect body in heaven as well. The only way to get to heaven and experience our ultimate makeover is to trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. If you'll allow me, I'd like to send you two resources that explain more about how to know Christ now and for eternity. One is a booklet called Your Greatest Turning Point, and the other is our monthly devotional magazine called Turning Points. Both of these can be yours free of charge if you will contact us here at Turning Point today. In addition to these free study resources, nothing is as profound as the Word of God. And now, Dr. Jeremiah has a Bible for every member of the family. There are numerous versions of the Jeremiah Study Bible, perfect for adults and teens. And the Airship Genesis Kids Study Bible will bring the truth of God's Word to the young ones in your life. Contact Turning Point for more information or to order today. Next time on Turning Point. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that we should walk in them. No, we're not saved by good works. We're saved for the purpose of doing good works. So that after we become Christians, we're to let our light so shine that men will see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Thank you for being with us today. Join us next time for Dr. Jeremiah's message, Heaven's Oscars, here on Turning Point.